Happy Saturday morning, everybody. This is a live update as storms are maturing to the west of Houston. And this could be a bit of a sleeper setup here across coastal Texas into southwestern Louisiana. We do have this line, this north-south band of convection that's trying to mature to the west of Houston. Most of these up here are going to be rainmakers. Flash flood potential in the Piney Woods to the north end of the northeast of Houston looks to be the main threat up there and probably down to the coastal regions as well. You can see this little bubbler down here on the west side of Houston too that's trying to mature. But I'm watching this line back from Port Lavaca up toward the Columbus area along I-10 just to the west of Houston as this could mature as it moves toward the town. We can look at uh, the uh, echo tops as well to really assess the robustness of these individual storms and you can see these high echo tops within this convective line these are really starting to build up above 40,000 feet this top here just to the south of Columbus but I'm really watching this area just to the north into the northeast of Port Lavaca for re-intensification there I'm also going to update you on the the damage survey up in Kentucky even though the latest uh, was a preliminary EF4 rating on Wednesday. I just want to discuss that path again. Looks like a 165.7 mile long path of the tornado that touched down just to the southwest of the Kentucky-Tennessee border and had EF4 damage in those communities uh, like Mayfield as well as Bremen, Benton, Princeton areas. And so I'm picking up a U-Haul today, this afternoon, uh, Flex Seal has been very gracious and giving me some resources, uh, some financial resources as well, to pick up supplies like tarps, chainsaws, other things that might be in need for the Kentucky damage path. And I'm going to leave at sunrise, probably before sunrise tomorrow, to bring it up here, uh, bring it up there. And the plan is to stop by the Nashville area too. And I might set up a meetup spot if people want to donate uh, supplies as well. We can pick it up with the U-Haul. We'll say hello as well before we head up. Uh, to that damage path. It sounds like they don't need clothes, water, uh, or really food supplies up in the damage path, but they do need things like tarps, chainsaws, um, other supplies that can help in the recovery effort. Uh, so we're going to be bringing those supplies uh, up to the damage path uh, tomorrow. I do wish we could have gotten up there earlier with different supplies right after the tornado damage path. Uh, but of course, we had to head up to the moderate risk up into eastern Nebraska into western Iowa. And that damage survey also continues up there as well. Uh, but we're watching uh, this setup down along coastal Texas. Wind shear is going to be relatively marginal down here uh, with that low level jet, uh, relatively modest and uh, a little bit veered. Uh, just a weak low level jet, but relatively weak surface winds beneath some of that flow at the low levels is going to produce about 125 to 150. Zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity will break down the environment uh, that these storms are moving into as well. Not, uh, it's possible that this storm just to the south of Columbus could be starting to show uh, some supercellular characteristics a bit. Uh, we can look at the velocity here and certainly see just a broad mesocyclone, maybe a little bit of a bird fart of an RFD trying to form there. Uh, but really, they are just starting to organize. Watching this area to the northwest of El Campo uh, could develop a tornado potential, uh, maybe to the north of uh, Port Lavaca as well, some of these lines. But it is a pretty low-end uh, tornado setup. I can't stress that enough. Uh, there is a 5%, uh, though, by uh, the National Weather Service, uh, the Storm Prediction Center down there. So anytime these convective lines start to settle in toward coastal Texas and southwestern Louisiana, it does seem like they often happen. Here's the update on the damage path here from the National Weather Service, Paducah. So this is the whole entire path. This is what was being considered as a potential record-breaking tornado with a path of longer than 219 miles. You had this first EF4 that touched down to the east of Jonesboro, went through Monette, went through Leechville, then went just to the south of Hayti, uh, then crossed the river off to the northeast. Uh, we were looking off to the northeast from the Haytai area on Aaron Jajak's photo, and it looks like we captured that rare glimpse of a cycle or maybe a cycle beginning to happen in northwestern Tennessee. We also utilized high-resolution satellite imagery to note that 15-mile break within the path just to the southwest of that Kentucky-Tennessee border. But then the new tornado, the new cycle, touched down just to the south of the Kentucky border, and then that one went for 165.7 miles incredibly long track tornado and this is a preliminary rating of ef4 so it still could be upgraded uh, to an ef5 uh, the uh, experts are on the ground right now trying to look uh, 
with a uh, very up close lens at the engineering of these homes trying to find that ef5 damage uh, but you can see their little red uh, uh, markers here that's ef4 damage but the 15 mile break in there was really key uh, for this tornado not to exceed that of the tri-state tornado of 219 miles but i think that the tri-state tornado also cycled maybe multiple times maybe even more than once once uh, but here is the tragic destructive tornado of 165.7 mile path length uh, moving right over the northern section of the land between the lakes area here lake barkley kentucky lake these two lakes right next to each other here you can see the mayfield area uh, with those ef4 indicators in red uh, continuing off to the northeast narrowly missing madisonville just off to the southeast and it didn't end up weakening until rough river state park up there near rough river lake that's when the tornado finally lifted up. And off to the south, you can see these other damage paths, including the Bowling Green, Kentucky damage, uh, which was an EF3 tornado. Uh, some EF3 indicators there in orange as well on the southwest side of town. And this is from that mode that we intercepted near Blytheville, Arkansas. And it continued to cruise off to the northeast. It was a little bit more of a QLCS type of mode, but you certainly had those embedded supercell structures and on upon approach to the Bowling Green area, you actually had three circulations. You had this northern one, which produced the tornado. That one weakened. And then we were watching the southernmost of the three circulations for a potential reintensification as it came into Bowling Green. And it ended up being the middle circulation, the middle of those three circulations that ended up intensifying rapidly as it came into Bowling Green, potentially uh, producing maybe up to EF4 damage, but the preliminary result is EF3 damage so far. So that is the update <clears throat> on the damage survey. The latest update was actually during uh, Wednesday evening. So still waiting uh, on the uh, update, the finalized uh, rating of EF4, or will it be upgraded to an EF5? Time will have to tell. A discussion that I, I had, though, uh, on a previous live was the difference between those Dixie Alley tornadoes and those that happen in the Great Plains. In the Great Plains, you can get those slower moving mega wedge type tornadoes with more directional shear and you have speed shear and instability. You had tornadoes like the Gerald, Texas tornado, which was moving at about 10 miles an hour. And those slower moving tornadoes have an increased residence time of the destructive winds over any given point on the ground. And I think that's why you have a lot of the more extreme damage and some of those higher wind estimates of those tornadoes up near 250, 260 with those tornadoes like Bridge Creek on May 3rd, 99, the Gerald, Texas tornado uh, as well in the late 1990s uh, that was moving at 10 miles an hour, nearly a stationary storm, 1997 there, propagation over translation dominating. And uh, Dixie Alley in the Mid-South, those tornadoes are translating 50, 60 miles an hour, sometimes even faster than that. That causes the southeast side of the tornado to have really destructive winds, relatively weaker on one side. So those RFDs are the right side of the tornado vortex are really intense. But the residence time of those destructive winds over any given point on the ground is quite a bit less. So I think that we're if you're to take those Dixie Alley tornadoes, which likely are stronger, and then make them stationary, then I think that you would see that extreme damage. And then you also uh, would need to have engineering of those homes sufficient to justify an EF5 rating. But it would be great to have a scale that's more representative of the tornado strength itself rather than estimating the tornado strength based on subjective uh, 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 damage indicators. They are objective. I understand uh, the force balance equations and engineers uh, putting that together, but it just doesn't seem like the residence time of those destructive winds are very well handled. It almost seems like an assumption that an instantaneous wind gust leads to instantaneous damage on the ground. Uh, but I'm not an engineering expert by any means. Uh, I'm just a storm chaser, meteorologist trying to break down uh, this setup here in coastal Texas. We have 40 knots uh, out of the southwest at 500, so that's going to create enough bulk shear. Uh, for those supercell storms. Low level shear though is quite marginal uh, for tornadoes and we're going to break down the wrap analysis here to see what kind of environment uh, these storms are moving into. This is the same front that fired supercell storms in southeastern Oklahoma too. That one that was approaching Ada, Oklahoma had a wall cloud. Those storms though uh, were undercut by that advancing boundary just sagging off to the south. Not enough of a low level jet out ahead of that sagging boundary to make it more stationary and to allow those storms to move off that boundary. We have a similar boundary today with that upper level low parallel to the boundary. So these storms that form along the immediate boundary are going to have difficulty moving off and will likely 
congeal, uh, leading to a flash flood threat there to the northwest of Houston up toward the College Station area. But this convective line off to the south is the, the one that I'm interested in. You can see this subtle uh, direction, wind direction change off to the west, shifting over to a southwest. You can see the southeasterly winds off to the east of that. And where these winds come together, that's creating this more meridionally oriented convective line just to the west of Houston. And uh, you also have these southeasterly winds here that you often get down here in coastal Texas. And that's what's going to squeeze out just enough wind shear to potentially lead to a tornado or two. You're talking about 100 uh, to 125 zero to one kilometer shear near the Houston area and to the west of Houston out ahead of that convective line. And uh, as we move forward in our forecast, we can see how that evolves over time. This is the wrap model. Here's the two hour forecast. And you don't really see that wind shear increasing much more than it is now on approach to Houston. So this event is definitely underway. Uh, this convective line sags down toward the Houston area. I think there's going to be more flash flooding than anything out there. And then eventually it moves offshore with that uh, potential tornado threat up near the Golden Nugget and Lake Charles area along Interstate 10 near and off to the east of Lake Charles as that sags off to the southeast. But this isn't an Arctic blast by any means. So this front is certainly not going to carve out the Gulf of Mexico, carve out that moisture. You're still going to have uh, that those great uh, decent dew points hugging the coastline. Let me log into my account here. There we go. Pivotal Weather Plus, y'all. Definitely stay tuned for my video later on. I'm going to be posting about meetup locations when I take these supplies up to the damage path. We'll meet up into the, Ash, uh, the Nashville area before heading up to Kentucky. I'm going to leave here, South Carolina, by about 5 in the morning when we head up there. So let's look at a, a closer look at the models here. And uh, let's look at some forecast soundings as well out ahead of the warm sector, out ahead of that convective line. Looking at the zero to one kilometer shear, this is at 19Z. You do have some non-zero shear here, hugging the coast, basically Houston toward Port Lavaca. Uh, any of those areas look quite substantial for potential of tornadoes. Uh, this is about the midday hour, so let's look at a forecast sounding just to the west of Houston. And not surprisingly, well, we do have an abundance of Cape, but those hodographs are quite skinny. Uh, there you can see the hodograph. It is, has a very nice shape to it with these uh, due easterly or east-northeasterly storm motions at about 20 knots. But your one kilometer wind of just about 30 knots. Over top your surface wind south southwest at about 15 knots. That creates your zero to one kilometer shear vector of about 20 knots there, which is sufficient to have a tornado threat, but it is uh, near that marginal level. Uh, your zero to one kilometer shear of about 120 Plenty of low-level moisture, low-level cape as well with some breaks in the clouds. A lot of cape here, the cape basically being the area proportional to the area between the dashed line, which is your parcel ascent, the red line there, which is temperature. But look at how moist it is all the way up. And not surprising, you don't get much of an elevated mix layer or that dry pocket right in the mid-levels of the troposphere, which would help to increase the cape even more. That's uh, simply because of the shape of this trough. Uh, you have that cutoff low way down off of Baja, and then you do have enough mid to upper level flow strung out here as that uh, boundary or that front is starting to sag down into Eastern Texas. You got about 40 knots here at 500. That's creating enough bulk shear, especially over those Southeast release. It creates an excess of 40 knots of bulk shear between the surface and six kilometers. Definitely sufficient for a tornado or two. Looking at your EHIs, this is a composite index to basically show where the surface base cape overlays with your zero to one kilometer shear. And you can certainly see the greatest wind shear is out ahead of that north-south convective line moving through the Port Lavaca area right now and uh, between Houston. And it looks like that surface base instability does not migrate up into southwestern Louisiana too much. So I think that this main threat is gonna be a Houston maybe Houston Beaumont and off to the southwest type of an event. Notice how uh, that surface base instability remains south of Interstate 10 and actually just offshore there of Cameron Parish down into southwestern Louisiana. But it does migrate ashore out here into Texas because of the shape of that coastline, that low-level jet uh, pumping that moisture 
that deeper moisture from the western Gulf of Mexico up along this area. Pretty good hodographs. Marginal shear, but well-shaped hodographs or critical angle. Uh, definitely close to 90 degrees. And then you bring a southeasterly wind. So superimpose a southeasterly wind at about 10 knots, and your shear vector is even longer. It's about 25 to 30 knots when you have a southeasterly wind uh, over top of that hodograph. That will increase the wind shear even more. Nevertheless, with a south-southwesterly wind, your 0 to 1 kilometer shear of about 151 there is uh, sufficient for an isolated tornado or two. And that's why the Storm Prediction Center does have that 5% area for tornadoes. However, the 12Z HRRR doesn't really have that north-south convective line. It has this cluster of renegade supercells to the west of Houston. So it seems like at least the 12Z models don't really have a very good handle on those southwesterlies off to the west and this meridional north-south line of those storms developing, but it does suggest a supercellular mode down there in southeast Texas, heading right toward the Houston area. Look at that. This is the HRRR model. Let me zoom in a little on this. Basically showing a cluster of supercells invading the Houston area by about midday. So by about noon, a little bit after noon, uh, that's when those supercells will move down to Houston, bringing with it a flash flood threat as well. The HRRR doesn't seem to have a perfect handle on this setup by any means, uh, but it does suggest this supercellular mode. I think, though, that they're going to develop in this north-south line that right now we can analyze on radar just to the west of the Houston area. And here is that radar right now this is actually happening right now and we do have this north south convective line from port lavaca up toward columbus time will tell as to whether this uh, cluster of supercells will continue to mature and then invade the houston area i do think that they will mature the h triple r certainly shows that you've got plenty of bulk shear hodographs you have marginal low level shear but a well-shaped hodograph with those near 90 degree critical angles and you superimpose a southeasterly wind within that hodograph and it increases your low level wind shear even more and it does appear that at least the uh the wrap analysis does seem to have a pretty good handle on that you've got these other storms that are intensifying uh, to the north of Houston over the Texas Piney Woods. These are going to be more rainmakers up here. Huntsville, you're getting hammered by heavy rain. Uh, back toward Prairie View, Magnolia, Conroe to the west of North Cleveland. And these are going to train over the same area as this front gradually sags toward Houston. So at the very least, I think you're going to get flooding in Houston. And I think that you could even get a tornado or two. This storm to the west of Highway 71, trying to get some supercellular characteristics north of El Campo there. Uh, watching this relatively closely, that uh, mesocyclone, though, struggling to intensify off to the west. I wouldn't be surprised if we do see uh, some hail with these storms, even though there's not much of an elevated mix layer with these. There is uh, plenty of cold air aloft for some hail. And down here, just on the east side of San Antonio, look at these storms starting to intensify. Severe thunderstorm warning includes the Stockdale area. Uh, decent hail associated with stor these storms up to one inch in diameter and some rotation to the northwest of Floresville as well. Floresville, a little bit of rotation up there uh, right over the highway now, uh, Highway 181 to the northwest of Floresville, heading toward Grass Pond Colony out there. A little bit of some rotation with this storm. But these look like mainly hail producers to the southeast of San Antonio. They're displaced well to the northwest of that low-level shear. The low-level shear is maximized ahead of these developing storms along this convergent boundary to the west of Houston. That's the area that I'm going to be watching relatively closely. Let's take a look now at the surface map down here, the real surface map. Look at those observations. Let's see if we can see any breaks in the clouds down into southeastern Texas, coastal Texas area. I do think that that boundary is a little bit stronger than some of the models were indicating. It's advancing just a little stronger. That's why yesterday uh, didn't quite materialize in terms of that tornado potential uh, across Oklahoma, southern Oklahoma. That's just because the boundary uh, was sagging off to the south and undercutting those storms just a bit. Here are the real obs down into Houston. And uh, this is why I think today has better tornado potential than yesterday because of these south southeasterly surface winds to the west of Houston. 
uh, especially just to the west, just west of Houston and ahead of that convective line. Winds to the west of that convective line, west of Port Lavaca, shift over to a southwesterly direction. It's not a dry line per se, but it is a bit of a prefrontal trough or a confluence line here with some slight drying off to the west of it. And then you have these mid-70s dew points streaming through the Houston area. Uh, temperatures warming up into the upper 70s. So some breaks in the clouds are happening down here to the southwest of Houston where it's warming up to 78. But a lot more cloud cover and stable low levels down into southwestern Louisiana uh, might preclude that tornado threat uh, to the east of the Beaumont-Port Arthur area. This is an awesome website to look at hodographs autumnsky.us just a uh, wonderful way to look at these forecast photographs using radar vad profile here and there is your photograph at houston let me straighten this out just a little bit this is your real-time shear profile in the houston area your one kilometer wind is about 25 knots so right now the HRRR is under forecasting that low level jet, uh, but it is over a due southwesterly low level jet. It is, however, showing these southeasterly winds relatively uh, well into the Houston area, of course, because it is radar. So you have that south southeasterly wind at a little over 10 knots, and then your one kilometer wind there, just in excess of 20 knots. I really think you're going to need to lengthen uh, that low level jet up to about 30 knots to realize that tornado potential. And these storms are going to have to turn hard to the right. You really need to do easterly storm motion at about 20 to 30 knots out here, even east-southeasterly with that southeasterly surface wind. It's possible that if that surface wind were weaker and south-southwest, then your critical angle might be just a little bit closer to 90 degrees for a right mover in east-northeasterly storm motion. But you really need this storm motion to be closer to due easterly to realize that area between the storm motion vector and the hodograph curve. And right now, they're just a little bit too shallow in the Houston area for that tornado potential. The HRRR says that the shear increases a little bit ahead of those storms. Uh, but with it being so marginal, I think that this is likely going to be more of a rainmaker as these storms move into Houston, training over the same areas here, uh, big rain happening. Uh, it's possible, though, that if any of these storms can mature along the southern edge of that convergent boundary and get more of a due easterly storm motion, then I think that they'll increase their tornado potential dramatically, especially out here to the southwest of Houston. Sugarland, uh, Needville down there toward Bay City. Keep an eye out. I think that this line is about to move east of Port Lavaca. More severe storms uh, to the northwest, but these are more hailers back here with some cold air aloft, a little bit elevated as well to the northwest of that boundary, sagging off to the southeast down near San Antonio. But they do our supercell structures. So you can see that they have hooks, elevated mesocyclones out there. And so we're just going to have to keep an eye on this setup during the day today. But definitely I uh, could have a threat of a noodle or two this afternoon. And uh, let's take a look now really quick at the rainfall that's going to be associated with this system. There's another look at the uh, photograph out of Houston. So we'll look at the HRRR really quick and compare some of the models, high resolution models, three kilometer NAM as well. But look at the rain, you could get five to seven inches here somewhere near the Houston area. And uh, the 15Z HRRR doesn't seem to show the congealing of those storms very well to the north of Houston over the Piney Woods. So I think we'll also get some greater precipitation just to the north of uh, Houston near the Huntsville area where some of those storms, those elevated storms, are certainly congealing together. Let's take a look at the three kilometer NAM as well. This seems to have a better handle on the precipitation that's gonna be falling from this event. Definitely shows these bigger totals to the north of Houston up over the Texas Piney Woods in the Huntsville area. But it looks like about three to four inches max out here in the Houston area. So probably some relatively minor flooding. Uh, some flooding of those bayous, but really nothing that the infrastructure can't handle down here in the Houston area. But if some of these storms are able to train a little bit more effectively, we could start to get some of those five to six inch type totals up there. There's your slight risk. And 
and there's no flash flood watch uh, just because it's a little bit underneath that criteria uh, for uh, the big flooding but you do have your first decent winter storm of the season up here in new england some winter storm warnings uh, good for the ski areas up into the northeast there you can see those winter storm warnings just to the west of my head that includes the adirondacks a large swath of vermont new hampshire into western maine as well white face much needed snow because after this recent warm-up a lot of the snowpack that was up there has definitely evaporated but much needed snow up here from the adirondacks and across the mountains of vermont new hampshire into western maine so thank you everybody for tuning into this weather report i'm going to keep watching this convective line to the west of houston could be a bit of a sleeper setup there is a slight risk down here uh, near the Houston area. I know my friend Eric Duncan, my storm chasing friend, is out there uh, covering this event. But right now, these storms are struggling to organize mesocyclones, relatively marginal bulk shear, certainly marginal low level shear looking at the uh, hodograph out of Houston. But there could be some flash flooding as this convective line moves in. Some of the models are showing three to four inches of rain max, but not big flooding because as this sags offshore, uh, you're not gonna get that really long duration rainfall event that can overwhelm uh, the infrastructure there in the Houston area. So thank you everybody for tuning into this morning weather briefing. I'll continue to update you as I pick up that U-Haul later on today, and then I'm gonna head up toward the Kentucky damage path to drop off some supplies. Thanks everybody, never stop chasing.